So today, uh, before we jump into a, a message, I want to recognize some folks. So we want to, first of all, recognize our oldest mother here today. So if I could have some of our First Impressions team help me out. I don't know who that oldest mother is, but we want to find out. So um, I'm just going to start asking. So I, do we have any mothers here that are 85 years or older. If we have any mothers here who are 85 or older, would you kindly stand, please, uh, if you can. All of our mothers who are 85 and older, or raise your hand and stand. So we have several, 85 or older. All right, let's give them a hand. So I'm going to keep going right here. All right, um, do we have, please remain standing. If you're 87 or older, please remain standing. If you're 87 or older, please remain standing. Okay, I'm going to have to kick this up a notch just a little bit. If you're 90 or older, please remain standing. Any mothers who are 90 or older? 90 or older. We just have one, is that right? We just have... One, so let me grab the microphone over here. I want to, we have a special gift for her. I'm going to recognize her over here. Could you stand for us? Could you stand for us? We want to recognize you today. Huh? Oh my God. Huh? Oh. So. Oh, you're more than welcome. You're more than welcome. So, so would you tell everybody your name and how old you are? I know we don't normally ask ladies how old they are, but would you tell us? Josephine Funny, and I am 90, going to be 60. 96? 95, going to be 96. In August. In, in August, all right. Isn't that amazing? So she's counting not only the years, but the months, all right? right. So 95 in about eight months, huh? Well, God Two, bless you months. in three months. God bless you. Let's give her a hand again. 95 years old today. So I would also like to have, if I could have all of our ladies across the auditorium, would you do me the honor of standing today? You, may, you might be a mother, you might not be a mother, but we want you to stand. So please, ladies, Vicki Stark, come on, all of our ladies, would you stand? Because we want to recognize you today. And so today we recognize our biological mothers, we recognize our mother figures, we recognize those who minister in our lives. We want you to know that today we honor you. You are extremely special to us to your family, but even more importantly, you're extremely special to God. And so today, we, we honor you, and we thank you so much for your life, for your testimony, for your investment in our lives. God bless you. I want to have a special time. Let's let them know how much we appreciate them. I want to have a special time of prayer today. Yeah, you may be seated. Father, we pray today for the ladies of our congregation. Father, we pray for those that are here that you've blessed with the privilege of being mothers, Lord, whether they're biological mothers, adoptive mothers. Father, we thank you so much for them. We pray for ladies in our congregation who, uh, who had a desire to be mothers, but for some reason, Father, you haven't allowed that to happen. We pray that you would be a blessing and encouragement them to, to them today. We pray for ladies who have, who have chosen not to be mothers. And Father, they've, they've chosen to make that decision. And yet, Lord, you allow them to have the privilege of mentoring and, and mothering so many people in their lives. We pray today for mothers who have lost their children. Father, I pray today that you would be of special comfort to them. I pray that you would give them grace. We pray for church members who have lost their mothers in recent days. Father, I pray that you would minister to them. Lord, today's a difficult day for them. I pray you'd give them grace and peace. I pray for mothers who have strained relationships with their kids. Lord, they'd, they'd love to have a close relationship, but for some reason, it's not there. I pray that you would minister to them 
today. I pray for kids who would love to have a close relationship with their mom, but it's not there. So Father, you know the hearts and the condition of each and every person here. And Father, I pray that you would minister to them as only you can. Father, we thank you so much for, once again, the ladies of our congregation. We honor them. We elevate them. We thank you so much for their ministry in our lives. Where would we be without them? So, Father, today we thank you for them. And it's in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. So in honor of our theme, today our theme is um, Portrait Sunday, as it were. We've given every mother that came in a frame, and there's a reason for that. We're going to be taking family pictures at the conclusion of the service. So in room 100 behind me, we have a photo place set up, and, and we'll be taking family, free family pictures for you. If you'd like to go by, we'd, we'd love to have uh, you go by and get a free family portrait. That'll be a tremendous way to, remembers mother, to remember Mother's Day 2019 at Hollywood Community Church. The purpose of a portrait, though, how many of you have ever had a family portrait before? All right. Most of us, a lot of us are a family portrait, or maybe at school you had your picture taken, you had your portrait taken. The purpose of a portrait is to take or to paint a picture, to capture an image, to create a way, to recall a special moment, or to remember a special family member. All of us have pictures or portraits of our mothers or our children or our families at our house. I wanted to start with here are a few awkward family photos. Maybe you've taken some awkward family photos before. I want to show here's some awkward family photos. I was just, I'm just drawn to that. I've never seen a mother and daughter who look so much alike as in that picture right there. Here's another awkward family photo. I don't know, this family, I kind of I kind of sat back and thought, you know, you're going to take a family picture and we sit back and think, okay, what are we going to wear? Let's wear our pink pajamas. I don't know, that's not something that we would ever choose as a family. Maybe that's what you would choose, I don't know. I thought this was fantastic. I mean, it's like, what are they doing to me, huh? I didn't want my picture taken, huh? This one really got me right here. It's like, okay, let's take a Christmas family photo Ladies, you wear your pajamas. I'm going to go shirtless. What do you think about that? I would just love to know the thought process behind that one right there. And then this one right here. Let's take a photo with our six monkeys. All right? I don't know. Awkward family portraits. You probably have some in your photo albums as well. Well, in the passage of Scripture that we're looking at today, Paul gives us a glimpse of a portrait, as it were. He, he gives us a glimpse of a picture of a mother who loves and cares for her children. We're going to read just two verses. We're going to read them in just a few moments. And I, I'm confident that these verses beautifully describe many of the mothers who are here in our congregation today. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. We're going to look at just two simple verses. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 7 and 8. Notice what Paul says. Paul says, But we were gentle among you, like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our own selves, because you had become very dear to us. First Thessalonians is widely believed to be the first letter or the first book written by the Apostle Paul. Sometimes we erroneously think that our, that our New Testament books are in chronological order, and they're not in chronological order. Uh, many believe that Paul's first letter was 1 Thessalonians. It was written during Paul's second missionary journey while he stayed in the city of Corinth for some 18 months. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, he, he commends the Thessalonians for their faith. 
Verse 7, he says, You became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. And by the way, if you were here last week and we studied first our 2 Corinthians chapter 8, we talked about the believers in Macedonia. And one of those cities was the city of Thessalonica to whom the Apostle Paul is writing this letter. He commends them for the tremendous faith that they had. Secondly, in chapter 2, he defends his apostolic ministry. And he tells the Thessalonians how proud he is of them. He ends chapter 2 with this statement. He says, For you are, are our glory and joy. For you, he tells them, are our glory and joy. I, I just got to pause because I want you to know that I feel the exact same way about Hollywood Community Church. And our elders and our pastors feel the exact same way about you. You are our glory. You, you bring us tremendous joy. We rejoice seeing what God is doing in your life. And we rejoice seeing what God is doing through your lives. Our text today, though, is not specifically written to mothers. We think on Mother's Day that we would, we would find a text that was specifically written to mothers. This passage is not specifically written to mothers. Rather, Paul is writing to spiritual leaders. And you might sit back and say, okay, Brian, so what in the world, what relevance does a passage that was written to spiritual leaders have to do with mothers on Mother's Day? Well, well, well two things. First of all, Paul challenges the Thessalonian leaders and he challenges us as leaders to be like mothers. He actually pulls some tremendous motherly characteristics that we're going to see in just a few moments and he applies them not just to mothers, but he applies them to leaders saying as spiritual leaders, we should treat others just as mothers treat their children. But there's a second reason why this is applicable today and it's, it's so poignant, it's this. Mothers are spiritual leaders. Mothers, I would challenge you today that you are spiritual leaders. The influence that you have in your home, the influence that you have with your children, the influence that you have with your grandchildren is unmatched. I would say in the home that I was growing up in, my, my dad was a great influence on my life, but I probably have not been influenced by anyone any more than I have my mother. I know with our children, I would love to think that I've invested into Justin and Mark and Amber, but I know that Vicki has invested much more into them. Her investment in their life is unmatched. Mothers, you are leaders. And mothers, you've been given an unbelievable responsibility to point your children to Jesus. And so the question I simply want us to ask and answer today, I guess I'd like to have you answer it, is this. What type of portrait are you leaving behind for your family members? So today, all of us are making a portrait. You're making a portrait. By the way, if you want a portrait of Brian, you can snap a picture right now. And there's, there's a portrait of Brian, and you can hang it on your house or something like that, all right? What type of portrait are you leaving behind for your kids, for your grandkids, for your spouse, for your family? These two verses, Paul, as it were, takes a spiritual camera and he gives us a glimpse of a mother who glorifies God and a mother who points her children to Jesus. So just a couple of simple truths today. The first is this, and Paul mentioned it in verse 7. Paul says that a godly mother responds with a gentle spirit. A godly mother responds with a gentle spirit. This, by the way, is the way that Paul led. And, and Paul is actually giving his testimony, defending his apostolic ministry, telling them that as he came into Thessalonica, he loved them, he cared for them in a gentle way. Paul says, but we were gentle among you. As an apostle, Paul could have made demands 
As, apostle, as an apostle, the apostle Paul could have been extremely demanding, extremely aggressive. But instead, Paul was gentle among the Thessalonians. And he describes his care of the Thessalonians in this way, like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. I sat back and thought, man, what a picture of gentleness. Like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. Think with me today, and mothers, you would understand this far more than, than I would, but there is an intimacy. There, there is a closeness that is experienced between a child and mother when they're nursing or when a child is feeding, or excuse me, when a mother is feeding the child. I don't think a child feeds the mother that often, but when, but when the mother feeds the child, there is an unbelievable intimacy there. Now, I know that mothers are extremely busy. They have many responsibilities. But when they feed their children, things slow down. Feeding your child is an all-consuming task. You cannot nurse your child and clean the house at the exact same time. You cannot, you cannot feed your baby and work out at the exact same time. You cannot feed your child and prepare a meal at the same time. When you're feeding your child, that child becomes the sole focus of your attention. You see, that closeness and that intimacy, that intimate affection is what the Apostle Paul wants his readers to see. Here's what Paul is saying. That's how leaders should lead. Now think with me, in our, in our culture, gentleness is not a characteristic that is often desired. I don't think in, in 35 years of ministry I've ever had anybody come into my office and sit down and say, you know what, Brian? I just need to be more gentle. <laughs> I, I, don't think, I know I've never had a man say that to me. I don't know whether I've ever had anyone come in and say, you know what? What I really need, Brian, pray for me so that I can be more gentle. To the contrary, often living in our fast-paced and success-oriented world, gentleness is not a characteristic that we often discuss or even strive to achieve. But Paul sits back and says, listen, as a leader, I was gentle among you, just as a mother is gentle with her child. The word gentle here actually has the idea of two things. First of all, it has the idea of humility. The, word, the Greek word that the Apostle Paul uses in this passage has the idea of an infant or a newborn baby. And Paul is literally saying, we were, we were to you just as an infant in its innocence is to its mother. We demonstrated humility to Call a man gentle is not often viewed as a compliment. <laughs> if I looked at some of our men and said, you know, don't you know, man, you are just an incredibly gentle man. You kind of look at me, you know, like I had four eyes and think, what in the world are you talking about? I'm not gentle. I'm pretty tough. I'm pretty rugged. I'm pretty manly. It's something that's foreign to us. Even women in our corporate world are encouraged to be aggressive and less gentle. But gentleness is not a weakness. Gentleness is a strength. As a matter of fact, throughout the New Testament, the word gentleness is used, and it's a different word, but it literally means strength under control. Let me show you two verses. Galatians chapter 5, verses 23 through 24, as the Apostle Paul lists the fruit of the Spirit, he says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self control. Against such there is no law. And in 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 11, the Apostle Paul speaking not to women, but to men, says, but as for you, O man of God, flee these things and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. So Paul would tell you, and me today, whether we're men or whether we're women, whether we're mothers or whether we're fathers, whatever our social standing is, he would look at us and say, pursue gentleness in your life. Such gentleness as a mother demonstrates to her nursing child. 
I sat back and thought, okay, so how does that flesh itself out? How does that work in, in our culture? How, how is Brian to be more gentle? How are you to be more gentle in our day-to-day lives? Let me just mention a couple of things. First of all, to be gentle means that I treat others as more important than myself. That's actually what a mother does as she spends spends time and focuses on her child and nurses and feeds that child, she realizes that the needs of the child are more important than her own needs. It means to be patient with the faults of others. Isn't it amazing how often we expect others to be patient with our faults and how little patience we have with the faults of others? To be gentle means that that I'm patient with the faults of others. It means that I I give people my attention. That's actually what, as we described, a mother nursing her child. It's a mother who slows way down, who realizes for the next period of time, all I'm going to do is focus my attention on this child. I'm going to be gentle with them. I'm going to give them all of my attention. Ah, i got to be honest, as I thought through that and prayed through that, I was extremely convicted because those of you who know me know that I'm kind of a bouncing off the walls type of guy and I'm, I'm running around trying to talk to as many people as I can and I have a tendency, I've probably done it to you and so let me ask forgiveness from the pulpit, but I've probably done it to you, but I have a tendency to, uh, even when I'm talking to you, to not give you all of my attention because I'm thinking through, okay, there's several other hundred people here in the congregation that I want to say hi to And so I'm saying hi to you, but I might be looking somewhere else at the next person. Have I ever done that to anybody? Oh, I have. Oh my word, I can't believe believe how responsive you are with all of that. All right, please forgive me. Please forgive me. I need to be more gentle. That's what it means. To, To give your attention to someone. To show them tenderness, love and compassion. That's what a mother does. And Paul says, man, here, here's the portrait of a godly mother. She's gentle with her children. You as a leader demonstrate that same type of gentleness. We have a tendency to be mean. We have a tendency to be gruff. We have a tendency to just tell others what we think. And Paul says that's not what a leader is. Notice the second thing that Paul says in the passage. She not only responds with gentleness, but she demonstrates genuine love. Notice verse 8. Paul says, So being affectionately desirous of you. That's one of those passages. This isn't the King James we're reading out of the ESV, and so it's a little bit more modern, a little bit more contemporary, but that's one of those phrases that we kind of read it and jump right over it because it's said in a little bit of formal English, and we don't understand exactly what the Apostle Paul is saying. What does it mean when Paul says, so being affectionately desirous of you? What does that mean? Here's what the, here's how the New Living Translation translates it. We loved you so much. We loved you so much, just as a mother loves her children. Love is a word that is almost synonymous with motherhood, is it not? To be a mother and not love is like a boat that can't sail. To be a mother who doesn't love is like being a plane who doesn't fly. Or to be a car that can't be driven. It makes no sense whatsoever. What does a mother do? A mother loves. That's what the Apostle Paul is saying. So, so in, in our leadership, we should not only demonstrate this motherly gentleness, but we should demonstrate this genuine love. You have to admit that there's a marked difference between the way dads love and the way moms love. But anybody agree with me on that? Come on dads, don't get defensive, all right? There's a marked difference between the way dads love, and I mean dads, we love our kids, right? There's no doubt about it. We love our kids. We just don't demonstrate it to the degree that our wives, the mothers, demonstrate it. That's, that's so true in our family. Kids call late at night, and I'm like, I don't want to talk to you, Vicki, you talk to the kids. All right, it's after nine. Of course, I don't talk to hardly anybody after nine o'clock, right? But, but the kids call and they know, okay, can't talk to dad now, but mom will talk to me anytime. 
Doesn't matter if you call at 1 or 2 o'clock in the morning. Vicky's like, hey, how are you doing? And she's excited to see the kids. And I'm like, get him off the phone. I'm going to bed. Kids call with a need. And my first reaction is, he's got a job. <laughs> What's he calling us with that need for? And her response is, come on now, Brian, we've got to give them money. Come on, we've got to do that. All right? Amber wakes up repeatedly through the night, and 99% of the time, guess who takes care of her? It's not me. It's Vicky. I love my kids. But, but, but there's something about a mother's love that is significant, that is different, that is genuine. That's what the Apostle Paul... Paul, Paul doesn't say, love like dads. Here's what Paul is saying. Love like moms. Love others as moms love their kids. Quite frankly, what the Apostle Paul is saying, and I, I kind of divide it into two simple points, it's this. We love others because Jesus loves us. That's the reality. We love our kids because Jesus loves us. We love our family because Jesus loves us. We love our neighbors because Jesus loves us. John alludes to that in 1 John chapter 4 and verse 8. John says this, anyone who does not love does not know God. And then he gives us a description of God. He says, for God is love. Say that with me today. God is love. Say it again. God is love. This is actually the third of John's great statements about the nature and character of God. John, his Gospel 4.24, he said, God is a spirit. You might remember that verse. In 1 John chapter 1, he says, God is light, telling us who God is. And here in 1 John chapter 4 and verse 8, he says, God is love. Grammatically, John is not saying that love is a quality that God possesses, but rather that love is a demonstration of who God is. God doesn't just possess love. God is not just loving. God is love. Love emanates from Him. Because it's who He is. In that same chapter, John tells us, we love because God first loved us. You see, we are only able to love because a caring, compassionate, and loving God created us. Catch this, church. This is, this is deep, but it's so true. It's simple, but it's deep. Without God, love does not exist. Did you ever think about that? Without love, or without God, excuse me, love does not exist. Let me illustrate it this way. It, it, it's like without oxygen, fire doesn't exist. You get the illustration? So here, my wife's a candle freak. I say that lovingly. I asked her, I asked her yesterday, I say, uh, Vicki, you got a candle that I can use? And she pulls out like 15 of them from underneath the, the cabinet and said, take your pick. Which one do you want? And so we realized that I can light this. And man, uh, fire is just there and it's flaming and it's beautiful. But all of a sudden, when I, when I snuff out the oxygen, what happens to the flame? The flame goes out. Fire is there. But fire cannot exist without oxygen. The same is true for love. Love cannot exist without God. The idea is not that every person that loves has to be a child of God, but God is present in our world. And because of the fact that God is present in our world, love exists. There will come a day, there will be a place that we refer to as hell in which God will not be there. And guess what else won't be there? Love won't be there. Why is that? Because God is love. Apart from God, love does not exist. Mother's love because God is love. There's a second truth that I wrote down there and it's this. We love others not only because Jesus loves us, but we love others as Jesus loves 
us. That's the way we should love, as Jesus loves us. John chapter 13, verse 34 says this, A new commandment I give you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. So John tells us that the love that we demonstrate for one another should be just as Jesus loves us. Man, we could park here forever. How does Jesus love us? Just a couple of truths. He loves impartially. Aren't you glad about that? Aren't you glad that He does? He's not up in heaven saying, okay, here's the deal. I love the good looking ones, but I don't love the not so good looking ones. Or I love this nationality, but I don't love this nationality. Or I love these people, but I don't love these people. That's not God. God, God, God loves impartially. He loves everyone. That's the way we should love. God's love is unconditional. God's love for you is not based upon what you do for Him. He doesn't love you because you do this for Him. It's not a quid pro quo. It's not a, you scratch my back and I'll scratch yours. You love me and I'll love you. No, that's not who God is. God loves us not because we love Him. As a matter of fact, we love Him. Why? Because He first loved us. God's love for us is unconditional. God's love for us is eternal. He, he, he will never stop loving us. I love the description of love that Paul gives in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Paul says this, and I want to read it, and I want to read it again. Paul says this, love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It's not arrogant or rude. It doesn't insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It doesn't rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. As I read that, I realized, man, you could take out the word love and put the word mother in there and it works just as well. Does it not? A mother is patient. Nobody ever said that about me. I don't think my kids ever would ever say, you know, at my funeral, Justin's not going to stand up and say, boy, you know, the one thing about my dad was he was patient. They're never going to say that about me. They can't say that about me. They can say that about mom. Mom is patient and kind. Mom doesn't envy or boast. She's not arrogant or rude. Mom doesn't insist on her own way. She's not irritable or resentful. She doesn't rejoice at wrongdoing, but she rejoices at the truth. Mom bears all things, believes all things. Mom hopes all things. Mom endures all things. Why is that? She demonstrates genuine love. There's a third thing that Paul says. And I'll be done. Paul says this, that a mother has a giving heart. I love this description. So at the end of verse 8, Paul says, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves, because you had become very dear to us. A mother has a giving heart. We're in the middle of a series. We kind of paused it today. We're in the middle of a series that we've simply described as overflow. We're talking about whole life generosity. And we've demonstrated or we've defined whole life generosity this way. Whole life generosity is an overflowing way of being and living rooted in a vibrant relationship with God that gratefully releases all in love to bless others. So here's what Paul says. He makes two simple applications. He says this to each of us. He was talking to the Thessalonian leaders and through time the message transcends us. He says this, like a mother, learn to give yourself to others. Like a mother, learn to give yourself to others. As I read that, I thought, what a perfect description of a mother. A mother is someone who willingly and regularly sacrifices her wants, her needs, her desires for the benefit of her children. And guys, we'd have to say for the benefit of her husband as well. Uh, all the time. I mean, I mean we'll, we'll end church and we'll say, okay, where do you want to go to lunch today? And Vicki will say, where do you want to go? And I'm always like, no, today we're going to go where you want to go. But guess where we always end up going? Where I want to go. 
And, and I don't think because it's so, I'm, I'm selfish and I'm self-centered. If I am, please tell me. I think it's because she always gives in. She always capitulates. It's who a mom is. 2014, Kevin Durant won the MVP award of the NBA. In that moment, as he accepted the award in his, uh, in his acceptance speech, Kevin Durant talked about his mother. And he made this statement. He said, he looked at her and he said, Mom, we weren't supposed to be here. You made us believe. You kept us off the street. You put clothes on our backs. You put food on the table. When you didn't eat, you made sure we ate. And you often went to sleep hungry. Mom, you sacrificed for us. Mom, you're the real MVP. What a great tribute to his mom. And today, we would say to you mothers and godly women who are a part of our congregation, you are the real MVP. You're the MVP in most homes. No one will ever really understand the sacrifices that a mother makes for her children. The hurts that she endures for her children. The sleepless nights that she goes through for her children. The worries that she has for her children. I read this week about a little girl who was looking at her mom's hair and her mom was brunette, but, but, but throughout all the brown hair, there were just a few white hairs that were beginning to peek out. This little girl reaches up and she pulls one of the white hairs and she asks her mom, she says, Mommy, how come some of your hairs are white? And the mother replies, well, every time that you do something wrong, every time that you make me cry, every time that you make me unhappy, one of my hairs turns white. And the little girl sits there and thinks for just a second and then says, Mommy, how come all of Grandma's hairs are white? Huh? Oh. Moms, you get what I'm talking about. The Apostle Paul says this, like mothers, learn to give yourself away. Real leaders are always sacrificing themselves for the benefit of others. That's what moms do. Paul makes one other statement. He says, like Paul, learn to give the gospel. Learn to give the gospel. Paul says, for we being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel, but we were ready to share our own selves with you. Moms, I, I would say this today. I'd be remiss in not saying this. This applies not only to moms, but to dads and to all of us. The most important thing that you can do for your child or your children is to point them to Jesus. Let me say that again. Moms and dads, hands down, the most important thing you can do for your children is to point them to Jesus. Let me say it one more time. Did you get it? If we're not careful, we get so wrapped up. We get so wrapped up into making sure that our kids have everything they need to be a success in this life. And either intentionally or unintentionally, we take their eyes off of the prize. We actually take their eyes off of a person. We want them to have the best that everything this life offers. And in the process, if we're not careful, we take their eyes off of Jesus. Paul says this, we were careful because we love you. Because we were gentle among you. Because we gave ourselves to you, we were careful to give you the gospel. The gospel of Jesus Christ. So 
So moms, dads, can I ask you a question today? What kind of portrait are you leaving behind? One of these days, you won't be on the scene. It's amazing to me how quickly life is passing. It's true. One of these days, Brian's not going to be around. I'm going to be a picture hanging on some. At least I hope I'm a picture hanging on somebody's wall. I hope my kids just don't have a picture of mom, you know. Here's mom and her second husband right here after, <laughs> after Brian passed away. All right. <laughs> By the way, I've prohibited Vicki from marrying. If the Lord takes me home again, she's not allowed to marry. All right. What kind of portrait are you leaving behind for your kids, for your grandkids, for your family, for your neighbors, for your co-workers? Are you pointing them to Jesus? That's what Paul says. What's a godly mother do? She responds with gentleness. She demonstrates genuine love. And thirdly, she has a giving heart. May God enable each and every one of us to love in that way. Would you stand with me today? So Jonas and the team are going to come and they're going to lead us in a great song as we conclude our service today. So, so let me just be really clear and honest today. Maybe you're here today, moms, can I talk to moms for just a second? I know not everybody's a mom. Moms, maybe you're here today and there's never been a moment in your life when you have recognized your need of Jesus. Not that you don't recognize who Jesus is and you don't recognize your need, but there's never been a time in your life when you have repented, truly repented of your sins and by faith reached out to Jesus in Jesus alone as your rescuer, as your redeemer, as your savior. And I would encourage you with the truth that even though you are extremely loved by your mother, there is no one who loves you any more than God, who sent His only Son, Jesus Christ, and died for you. You can't leave a godly portrait if you're not a follower of Jesus Christ. That's where it starts. And so in your heart of hearts, if you've never come to that place where, you have, where you've repented of your sins and reached out to Jesus, I would encourage you to do that right where you are. Reach out to Jesus. You might sit back and say, Brian, I'm a mom or a dad and I'm a follower of Christ, but I'm, I'm not sure the type of portrait that I'm leaving behind. The good news is there's still time. There's still time. For you to be the dad, the mom, the husband, the wife, the friend, the follower of Christ, who God wants you to be. Allow the Holy Spirit of God to do a work in your heart. Allow Him to examine you. He'll tell you what He wants you to do. Father, thank You so much for the truth of Your Word. Help us to take the truth, apply it to our lives, and act on it. I pray that the Gospel would change us to the moms, the dads, the husbands, the wives, the workers, the bosses, the neighbors, the friends that you would have us to be. Help us to love like Jesus. And it's in Jesus' name.